Today we're going to finish a guitar body with shellac and we're going to be doing it on the Junk Parts Les Paul Jr. Last time that you saw this guitar, I was working on the inlay work and getting the prep stuff done to prepare us for these finishing steps. Prior to the start of this video, we sanded it to 80 grit and then I went and took a rasp to all of the inlay edges, cut them all flush, and from there I took a pencil, scribbled all over the whole body front and back, and I sanded to 120, knowing that by the time all those pencil marks were gone, we had thoroughly sanded that entire level of grit. Beyond that, we did the same thing again, sanded it to 240 over a guide coat, and then we started with a uh, few quick coats of a two pound cut of shellac. That's where we're at now. We've done the finished sanding and we've just done a couple of sealing coats of shellac. To start you off, let me tell you, the two pound cut is a commonly utilized cut of shellac if you're using flakes like I am. And there is some math involved and you do wanna get a digital scale eventually, but you know, it's really handy because a two pound cut of shellac is two pounds of shellac flakes in one gallon of your solvent. For me, I'm actually using Everclear because I happened to have a bottle on hand. There are definitely cheaper options than that. The thing that makes that easy math is you've got 16 ounces in a pound and you've got 16 cups in a gallon. So two pounds into one gallon equates to two ounces into one cup. And you can work from that smaller number a lot more easily when you're making smaller batches. You can buy a four ounce bag of shellac flakes on Amazon. Now you don't have to worry about a digital scale because you have four ounces of shellac that dissolves into two cups of your solvent. This is how I did my two pound cut. I didn't make a huge batch. It should be good for about six months after it's been mixed, as long as it's kept in an airtight container. So we're keeping the math as easy as we possibly can. That's where I started with the first three coats of shellac that I used for this sanding sealer. I started with rubbing it in circles, hand rubbing it in a cotton applicator. Now let me show you how I make that applicator and then we will move on to the rest of the finishing process from here. Making an applicator for shellac is super simple. Really all you need is a piece of fabric, a bunch of cotton balls to fill it with, and something to tie up the bundle with. Most people will use linen and suggest linen for the cloth because it doesn't have the short fibers that are gonna shed out of it as easily as some other fabrics do, and you're gonna have one less thing to fight with. In my case, I have an old hoodie that I had cut up, so this is just cotton hoodie fabric. The cotton balls came from the dollar store, so this bag is gonna last me literally years if I only use it for this. I used to use hair ties to bundle up everything. In this case, I just have some floral wire that I'm gonna use. We're gonna put down the fabric. We're gonna stuff a bunch of cotton balls in it. Bring in the corners. You wanna get it relatively tight, but you still wanna be able to squeeze it because you want these cotton balls to be able to absorb the shellac and the alcohol or solvent. So now we have an applicator that has a reservoir of cotton balls and a nice smooth finishing pad here. If you have a fabric like this and you're concerned about it, you can take uh, like a fabric shaver, a pill shaver, and shave off the top layer so that you don't have any sort of lint that comes out. If you're particularly worried beyond that, you can just find something like the linen that I mentioned before, something that's less likely to shed fibers. Now, I haven't had too much of a problem with these things shedding fibers, except where I'm using them to rub on a finish on a guitar body that's already been routed. Those sharp 90 degree corners on the edges of the cavities will tend to pull at the edge of this, especially if the shellac is getting dry and it will pull out fibers. So that is why I'm finishing this body before I do the final cavity routes. I wanna see how that goes to prevent that issue. But this is the cheap, easy way to do it. The expensive way is not any different. You're just gonna use finer materials. Now, one of the really cool things about shellac is that it is soluble in alcohol and that might be bad for using it to make bar tops or something like that, but it is really good for reusing your applicators and all that sort of stuff. So in between uses, I take a little bit of alcohol, you can see not much, and I'll just drop the applicator right in there into one of these pint-sized mason jars. You see it's already absorbed that alcohol, there's nothing left there in the jar, it's all gone straight into the pad. It's gonna distribute relatively evenly through the pad while you've got it sitting on the shelf waiting for the next time you use it. And 
and it's gonna keep everything soft. I will usually use a pad for an entirety of one project. These are cheap enough. That way I don't have to do this every single session. I can keep using it. If I'm using it on a two pound cut on a single guitar body, I will keep using this pad through that whole project and then I won't make a new one until I start the next project. Some people will keep these for a lot longer than that. Some people will make them every session. It's really up to personal taste. This is usually the collection of jars that I'll use for a project. I'll mix my shellac in a one quart mason jar like this and this will be the cut that I'm using for the project. I will store the applicator in the pint. I'll pour a little bit of the shellac that I'm using out of the quart and into this eight ounce jar because the applicator can actually reach into that and I'm not trying to fish into this large jar and I'll just keep replenishing that. Now, as I mentioned, I sanded this up through 80 grit, 120 grit, and then uh, 220, 240 grit. I have put a couple of quick coats of the two pound cut of shellac on here. Now, as you go down through the layers of shellac, you're gonna wanna make it a thinner and thinner cut. That is, you're gonna put more solvent in it to help smooth out everything. But when you're starting, you need to put on these heavier coats to start building up something. I made the mistake with my earlier efforts with shellac of starting with a thinner cut because I was concerned about building up too much too quick and creating ripples or anything like that. But the problem is that that solvent is just gonna wipe away the previous layer and you're just gonna keep working against yourself. It took me 12, 15, 18 coats before I started building up a gloss. Whereas here with a two pound cut, I've already got a gloss building on the third coat. Dip that a little bit and we're gonna just tap it a little bit to kind of force it to distribute a little more evenly and we're gonna start rubbing and the most important thing is to keep moving because you don't want the shellac to get stuck on what's already drying and it does dry very quickly one of the other really cool things about shellac is it dries so quickly because its solvent is alcohol based that by the time i've done the back coat here the front is already dry and ready for the next one so i'll be able to put a few coats on in one session, but as soon as it starts getting sticky or it seems like it's not curing as quickly or drying as quickly as it was before, put it away for the day. Now, in one of my earlier projects, one of the things I learned was that I was overthinking it. Now, you want to make sure that you are learning everything you can. You, there's hints and tips and tricks and methods and everything to how shellac works. But with anything, there is some point where if, if you're overthinking it, you're going to mess it up in the other direction, right? So I was putting all this time and effort into trying to make the front and the back perfect. And then what came out really nice and glassy and smooth was these edges that when I was doing it, I just kind of like put it on and moved on. You know, I wasn't hand polishing every inch. I was just running an edge on it and moving on. And those came out the nicest because on these parts, I was overthinking it. I was overworking it. Speaking of techniques, a thing I'm going to try here is putting just a few drops of a non-drying oil on that's gonna help lubricate the pad and enable me to keep working a little bit more to polish up this shine. That definitely did let me get a little bit more working time. It's just a little bit. Like I just kind of splashed some on my finger and wiped it on the back of the guitar. And that seems to be more than enough. It's starting to get a little tacky though. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna put it in the drying rack and we're gonna leave it be for at least a few hours, but probably till tomorrow. And here's where I made the big stupid mistake. I know that my shop is not the driest place to be keeping wood. And I know that I don't leave semi-finished or finished projects down here. So I took this guitar body with its first several coats of shellac. I left it down here in the drying rack for a few days. In those few days, the rain started coming down pretty heavy. My basement flooded and this guitar managed to succumb to enough humidity to make some of the wood move. It's not disastrous, it's not like warped, cupped, anything like that, but where the boards come together and especially where the inlay is, you can feel now the seams when you run your hand over it where you could not do that before. It was a nice and smooth finish and now I've got seams here. So the solution is going to be, I'm going to need to bust out the hand sanding block again. I'm gonna go with the entire body with a 220 grit sandpaper by hand. I'm going to hope that that's enough grit to smooth out everything without me having to step down further. Now, theoretically, I would only need to sand smooth the areas where the wood has moved and you can feel that. However, that means that I will be sanding back some of the finish. 
So instead of dealing with potential splotchiness or uneven finish, I'm going to sand the entire body with the 220. That's also going to help to level that finish and make it even smoother than it was in the first place. The good news is that I get to utilize this chance to flatten the surface even more and even out all of those coats of shellac that I've put down up to this point, they'll still be acting as a sanding sealer and a good foundation to fill the grain and to build up the future layers. And hopefully I'll get to that glossy finish even quicker this time around. Now I'm going to keep myself from making the same mistake, well two of the same mistakes that I've made in the past. I'm going to stop right here for now. I'm going to not overwork the surface. I think probably one more session with another three or four coats will probably get me where I want it to be, but I'm going to let this totally cure before I start that. The second mistake I'm going to avoid making is I'm going to go put this in my drying rack for maybe an hour so that it cures enough for me to bring it upstairs and put it on the guitar rack and I'm going to not leave it overnight. All right, I'm back the next day. Before I get started, I wanted to mention that I'm switching back and forth between two different methods here. When I'm applying the finish, I'm switching back and forth between circular polishing coats and long uh, strokes that go along the grain of the wood. And there's a few different reasons for that. The main reason I'm doing that is so that I don't build up any ripples or imperfections or runs in the finish from going in the same direction over and over again. You can tend to build up streaks in that way. Shellac is a lot less susceptible to streaks, but by alternating, you're gonna really almost completely eliminate those happening between the alternating coats uh, working against allowing that to happen in the first place and shellac's tendency to meld previous coats together with the new stuff as the alcohol dissolves the old finish. Now the other thing that I want to mention is that when I'm working with the grain, I'm starting with my applicator pad off of the guitar and I'm coming in and I'm not making contact on a flat part of the guitar because you'll create that dab and that kind of ripple and that build up right there where you make contact or right where you lift off from contact. So start off the body, come in from an edge and then don't lift until you go off the other edge and you'll get a much better finish that way. You might get some squeeze out on these edges, but I'm usually doing the edge next anyway, so I just take a stroke around the guitar body to clean that up in the process. I'm gonna get three or four more coats on this, whatever it will take before it starts, you know, not curing completely between coats and then we'll hang it up again for the day. But I have a feeling from the gloss I'm getting at this point that I'm nearly done with. I do like to finish a session with a coat that I've done along the grain, just because these circular ones, while they do tend to get more of the finish down onto the body, do tend to leave a few more ripples than the ones we do along the grain. So I like to make sure I'm leaving the day or the session with as smooth of a surface as possible. Especially so that once it is cured and I go to pick it up for the next day, I have a much better idea of how much more work I have to do. So let's do one more coat. Now we're building up a pretty good gloss. I think that when I come back through later today, I'll probably just put a few more final coats on uh, to finish it up completely. But there isn't gonna be anything different at that point in time that I haven't already shown you. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead for your sake to the next step of the process. All right, so I'm about to start my last session with the shellac here on this body and I'm testing out a new camera rig here. So hopefully it doesn't sound too terrible. So as you can see, I took the handle off of here. I've already taken care of the sides and the back of this and gotten it to where I want it to be. So I'm just focusing on the top right now. The important thing with the last session here, notice I'll keep saying sessions here because I've lost track of coats at this point. Coats are a little less important. 
with the shellac, since you can do like three to five coats each time you do it, I'm just keeping track of how many times I've had to work with it. And you can do two to three sessions in a day, or you can do like I've done here and do like a session each day after coming home from work. Now that we've spent several sessions putting shellac on, what we're gonna do is we're going to work on smoothing it out. The way that we're gonna do this is we're going to stop adding our mixed shellac, our two pound cut into the mix here. All we're going to do is we're going to put a few drops of our solvent into our jar here. We're going to let that be absorbed by our applicator pad so that every time we do this, we're diluting the shellac that's still left in the pad and we're just doing a stronger and stronger mix of just the solvent. And then we're going to take it to this along the grain and all this is gonna do is it's going to smooth out the top layers and help us get that really gloss finish. So let me come back to you after I've done a couple passes here and I'll show you where we're at. Very, very last thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna grab a completely fresh, dry, unused piece of fabric. And I'm going to do a couple passes of pure solvent, nothing else. And this is what they refer to as ghosting because all you're doing is putting the solvent on. You're not adding any finish on this layer. You do have to be very careful though because it is easy enough to actually pull up more finish rather than smoothing it at this point. Now, another thing that you can do as the last finishing process, and I'm taking the risk of overworking by doing this, is you can hit it with a 600 grit sandpaper or something even finer would probably be better, and then wipe it down with just a damp rag to get the dust up, and then put one last final coat of the shellac. This should smooth everything out pretty nicely. Like I said, I am at the risk of overworking this because I'm going to do both of these methods on here and we'll see how it goes. Worst case scenario, I'll just have to put more shellac down and it'll just be more protective finish, right? One pass, that's all I'm doing here because I don't want to build up those ripples and imperfections again. I'm going to let that cure. I'm going to walk away from it. So as I feared, I did overwork it a little bit and pull back a little too much of the finish between the ghosting technique and the sanding technique. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to add a couple more layers that hopefully you will not have to add because you will pick one of those two techniques to finish the last couple layers with. I also started editing this video and realized that it's already longer than I want it to be. So I'm going to keep it to just the finish in this video, get you some decent B-roll to run while I'm talking here. And uh, we'll be back with the next installment once I've routed the cavities and I'm ready to put it together and show you all of the weird things that I'm going to do with the wiring. And then we'll have demo clips and hopefully I'll see you then.